Hey, good morning. Hey, I think I've got everything working just right this morning, so I'm glad to be with you. Uh, glad to be able to join you in a cup of coffee or a drive into work or whatever you're doing right now as you uh, tune in. Maybe you're going to be tuning in later in the day. Glad you could join us whenever it is. Uh, it's always good to get together, talk about what's going on out in the world and how the Bible relates to it. Speaking of that, the one thing I forgot to bring over in your in your uh uh it'll show up on your screen but i don't have it next to me i'm gonna go grab my bible so hang on i'll be right back Woo, man ill-equipped without this in hand or you know you don't always have it like this in book form sometimes you have it like this in digital form we're going to be talking a little bit about that today there are some there are some, some concerns that have been uh, foisted about the risk that is at hand with regard to putting the Bible into digital form because it's so easily changed and altered without necessarily people knowing what's going on. You know, so a little word tweak here or there. And I have noticed that that is, is a reality. So for instance, I've got a print version of the English Standard uh, Bible, English Standard Version. I will be reading through this. I'll take up the English Standard Version and maybe they've made a revision to that. And I'll notice that there's words that are different on the digital version than are in the print version. Uh, now, are those legitimate changes that are being made? Sometimes. But uh, if they don't have an, uh, an editorial note, like uh, so many, this is the uh, fifth edition of this translation and, and so on and so forth. If you think you're picking up the English Standard Version and you're reading the English Standard Version and the two versions aren't the same, it should cause you to question that a little bit. So th that's something to keep in mind. But here's, a, here's another neat thing. It's important to have this word at your fingertips. To be able to look up things or challenge yourself and when you come into the context of the world around you, what this has to say to it. But you can't always be just holding a big book like this. And this is a good one. I, I mean, I, I, would in, I would encourage you, if you're going to get a Bible, get a study Bible. Get a reputable one. So do some investigative work. This is a Lutheran study Bible. I feel pretty confident in the notes and stuff that are in here. But the most valuable parts aren't the commentaries. I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever trust the commentaries, regardless of the source. Trust the word. The, the commentary are man's thoughts regarding the word. And God speaks to us directly through that word. Not that he can't assist us through the words that other people give us, the thoughts and insights and commentaries of the people around us. But it's God speaking to us that we should really crave. And he does that. So uh, take, the, take the commentary, whatever commentary that is you're looking at, with a grain of salt and concentrate the bulk of your emphasis on the actual word itself and let God speak to you. In fact, I would say, as you approach God's word, a great way to do this, and we're going to do this right now, is to start off with a word of prayer. Lord God, I pray that as we dig into your word today, as we try to see the world through the lens of, of the Bible, that you'll help us to see the importance of our awareness of your intention, your purpose, your design for our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so you want to keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Let the Spirit guide you, uh, and, and he will. That's what he is. He's the guide to truth. So trust in him to guide you. And where he guides you, trust in him and go. Uh, so I want to keep that in mind. We're going to be looking at this word here in just a, just a minute. Let me pull my table over here. My table. Hey, my table. You know what my table is? My table is a high chair, but it works really well because it's at just the right height uh, for me to be able to lay my Bible alongside of me and have it available. I like to have it there. I don't always pick it up because I've got uh, it in my in the in the computer uh, ready to pop up on the screen so that we can look at it together. 
and have that in front of you. But I like to have it at my fingertips in case there's something I want to look at that's not included in the presentation that I have for you. Today's topic, I mean, we've been looking at an interesting topic. Hasn't science disproved the Bible? Well, today's topic is, is I think, especially interesting. So let's let me jump over there here with this. So hasn't science disproved the Bible? No, I've already given you that spoiler alert, but check this out, because I don't think that we oftentimes think of it in these terms, but imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. You know, as we, as we look at science maybe working to try and disprove the Bible in a lot of different ways, I want you to take note of the way that it imitates it in so many ways, and that, and that many of the things that it actually wants to deny uh, as possible or that they existed or could have been recorded correctly in the word are things that they're actually trying to duplicate in the here and now. So that that is a very interesting perspective if you take that into your worldview and say, hey, you know, I, I get it that this is hard for you to believe. And yet at the same time, the scientists are doing this. They're doing this very same thing that was spoken of, that's, that was done you know, maybe it's an activity or an action uh, that was done 2,000 years ago or 3,000 or 4,000, 6,000 years ago. We see the same thing. That's one of those uh, uh, biblical truths. Solomon, we looked at Solomon yesterday, wisest man on the planet. Talked about him from a scientific perspective. All these smart people, yet him the smartest. And yet Jesus wasn't just a wise person. He was wisdom in the flesh. And we look at Solomon and what Solomon had to, to contribute to, to the world and his, his wisdom that he supplied is something that we emulate. The people that are wise now aren't nearly as wise as he was. And yet he applied himself toward foolishness and many of the wise people, smart people today are among the, are among the fools. There's a quote uh, comes from iRobot. If you ever seen the Will Smith movie iRobot, you're the dumbest smart person. <laughs> Will Smith was uh, going nuts over the scientists that he was interacting with because she just didn't get what was going on. That he was telling her this is what's happening, and she denied it entirely because it didn't seem scientifically valid, and yet. It was, as the movie portrays it, according to the plot, true. So that was, I mean, that was science fiction. But it's amazing how much science fiction imitates reality. And it's important, I mean, in, when you're crafting a good story, to have a good, uh, a, a lot of truth included in with that, that narrative in order to make it believable so that the, pe the audience is drawn in and captivated by the storyline and the plot holds your attention. So you got to keep that in mind. There's a lot of truth included in fiction. Uh, so you have to navigate your way carefully through that to know the difference between that which is make-believe, that which is real, and know when what is what. Okay. Some of, the, some of the things that are surreal capture our attention in a positive way when maybe they should be causing us to become a little bit concerned. That's what we're going to look at today. So we have science doesn't disprove the Bible. In, in fact, it imitates a lot of what's in the Bible so that things that were sinful a long time ago, are still sinful now. Maybe they just present themselves differently, or maybe they've been accept, made acceptable or normal or something like that. But one thing Solomon made us aware of, said there is nothing new under the sun. So when we think about all the innovations and the improvements of technology and stuff like this, they're really not doing anything new. And they're imitations of something old. 
Okay, so let's keep that in mind. We're, just talking, we're talking about science, and today we're going to be talking a lot about technology and the advancements in technology in, in terms of their imitation of life. So this may be more in the area of artificial intelligence. So one of the one of the changes in perspective that has occurred over recent years has been the acceptance of an intelligent design. And I say that kind of holding back a little bit because I don't know that there's a general acceptance of it so much as an as an imitation of it. So that there, there is a a knowledge that says there had to be an intelligent design in order for things to be as they are. So yesterday we looked at scientists that believe in God and they look at things in their smallest, you know, the, the, the atom. They look at these things in the most minute detail and they see the complexity of that. And within those things, the smaller they are, the more complex parts they see, the details of everything that's involved and they know God through his design. They know the designer through the design. And these scientists that, that are open to believing in the existence of God can see a lot and learn a lot about the God who made all of it. That's not a really outrageous thing to say, but it is outrageous to a lot of people to include God in that study in that process in that knowledge so when we look at the artificial intelligence we're looking at people designing an intelligence that is to be intelligent <laughs> designing computers that are able to learn what when i say this is imitation i want you to think about how god designed us he he Put together everything on the planet and then he created humans and and said he created them in his image and gave them a, the responsibility stewardship of the planet they were able to think he breathed life into them and these sentient beings were given this free will that they were able to know and and do the perform the tasks that God had given to them of stewarding the planet. And now these intelligent scientists are duplicating that creative work in technology, in creating a computer that is able to think or anticipate thoughts of others. I was looking at some of some of that design process of, of a computer being able to now read. Not only do they do fa facial identification, now they're able to identify what the facial features are expressing. So, so on your computer where you have a webcam or something, the the computer is able to begin to know whether you're happy or sad. And you know this because you've seen filters and you use some of the filters and you see the interactive qualities of the filters just on those little silly fun things. And yet through those silly fun things, the computer is demonstrating its ability to read your motions and your emotions and your reactions to different things. So genius, genius stuff. This is amazing. Uh, things that are being done technologies that are that we're on we've already got use of or we're on the cusp of using and those can be exciting and thrilling and we can really appreciate that and yet at the same time they might cause us to raise our awareness on some things so let's let's look at a little bit of the technology as we have it so maybe you've seen some of these things uh some of our wearable technologies. The, I think the watches are pretty commonplace now where people will have the watch and they'll be able to take phone calls on their watches. They'll be able to do internet searches through their watches. All sorts of different things. Uh, they can use that watch as even like a Fitbit or maybe they have a separate device, a Fitbit that will measure the heart rate and things on your body and be able to track those things for you. There are other things like the the uh, 
devices that we see here. Some of these we think of wearables, you know, like our headsets and things that we use with our iPad, our iPhones and iStuff. Uh, but here's here's another set of devices that maybe we could think of as well. Just think about this. Um, we've got the the earbuds or the uh, the Bluetooth phones. We've got the uh, hearing aids. So that's technology that's used to enhance our hearing, help those especially that are having a difficult time hearing. But then there's also the the Bluetooth telephone. And you, you know what it's like when you go through a, a store and someone walks through and they're, and they're talking to someone. It looks like they're talking to themselves. You don't realize. They, maybe you think they're talking to you and you start talking back to them. And then you realize, you know, they, they, they point up at their ear and they show you that they're actually talking to someone else. Don't interrupt them in the middle of a conversation, even though they look like a crazy person walking through a store. Uh, that has become pretty normal. These days, and, th and these hand-free devices are great. You're driving down the road. It's nice to be able to carry on a conversation without a having to take your hands off the wheel or look at a lot of different things. So pretty cool. Uh, some of the devices that are featured on this on that slide include a pacemaker. That's the thing that's held in the hand, and defibrillators. Now, the pacemaker. If you've seen someone wear the pacemaker, they might point to a, a spot if they. If they pull open their shirt, you could see the, the lump under the skin where the pacemaker has been implanted in the skin and helps to regulate the, the pace of the heart. The de defibrillators that have been exclusively on the outside of the body, you know, it's many places are now hanging these on their walls. They're having them there just in case of an emergency. If needed, they can pull it off the wall, charge it up, and, and zap the person uh, through this defibrillator, but now they're also including these as things like the pacemaker where you can have a defibrillator if your heart is prone to stop and beating and the pacemaker is not, they can have a little jolt that they zap it with uh, right inside you can be walking defibrillator. Now, I don't know, it'd be kind of interesting, and maybe they'll do this in the future, if there were a few extension plug-ins or something, you could just take off, hey, this person gave up, instead of us taking it off the wall, you just pull it out of your chest, and you zap the person next to you, and you, just in case, kind of like a spare tire that you keep in the trunk of your car. And you're able to not only serve as having that defibrillator for yourself, but now you got it for someone else. Pretty cool. You know, these technologies, maybe I'm not the guy to be doing the inventing of these things, but these technologies are pretty cool, and they can be pretty benefit, beneficial to us. But then they can go a step further, and this is where we get into that Im imitation is the sincerest form of flattery when people start to integrate some of these things together. So let me get to uh, to this. Like, say, instead of... Instead of just what we see there, we start to see something like this. And this smart pill, smart pills, also known as digital pill. These aren't the, these aren't the ginkgo biloba type of things, the, the vitamins or supplements to your diet that help to enhance brain function. This, this is actually technology that's ingested. So smart pills, also known as a digital pill, are medications prescribed by patients. Now, this is how they start with just that, but then that are equipped with enabled electronic sensors that send wireless messages to devices like patches, tablets, or smartphones outside the body when they're ingested. And so we, we start to ingest technology, and then that technology is able to be read by other things around us. So uh, this could be very similar to when I went on my to, to our road trip this last weekend, went on the concert trip, and on our way in, thought, what are we going to do about parking? Parking is always such a headache whenever you go to a big event. And for me, I'm not a big city person, so I like, I like the country where you don't have to worry about your parking. You just kind of drive and you park on the side of the road if you need to. But when you get into the city, it, parking's really important. And so on our way in, I was able to go through our, our device, my phone, and on the internet, locate the parking, and through the parking, 
identify a lot that I wanted to park at by my parking in advance. I got a code on my phone. We drove up into the parking lot, held out the phone. It was read by the, the reader on a little uh, QR code that we were supplied with, allowed us in, raised the gate, and then on the way out, held up the phone again. It read it, raised the gate, and out we went. Amazing technology. Well, we get that ingested into us, and that same phone that was giving parking instructions is now able to read things that are going on inside my body. And maybe we then fiddle with it a little bit, and we can actually send messages back and forth. That's, that's where we're going. Some of this we started to see a little bit in the pandemic when there was an emphasis on getting the vaccinations out there and the rolling out. And this was kind of the scary part is wondering what's all included with your superior vaccination that you're getting that wound up being not nearly as effective as it was supposed to be, as it was billed to be. But the emphasis, I think, was on making sure people were willing to, to take this jab, to get this shot, and repeatedly. And as that, and as that got rolled out and people were vaccinated, then came the, the requirements and the mandates that said, okay, now you're only allowed to do such and such if you're vaccinated. You can tra your travel will be limited. Your economics uh, exchange will be limited. Your ability to go into restaurants will be limited. And they, and they started doing this with like paper cards. So then they saw people were starting to counterfeit these cards. So then the, the notion was, and this was actually being done in, in some places. I don't think it, I saw this happening too much in the United States, but it was in, uh, instituted in some places where they would embed a, an identification chip that would say that you were vaccinated. So when you got your vaccination, you got your chip that said this has happened. Now, if you had some sort of technology in there, they would just update that okay, this person received this treatment and that's included now in your personal record that you carry with you in your skin all the time. And if you, you go to the doctor, they can see exactly what your medical history is because they can read that through that, that chip. Uh, you go to a travel center, you plan a trip, they'll be able to determine where you're able to go based on your shot record. Some places you need to get an update for this or that. You have to be vaccinated for other things, diseases that are common to those areas. But you see where that's all going then. For our physical health, we might be willing to do these certain things because they enable us to maybe think less about it. So in the process of getting these tech, this technology to think more, it enables us to think less and to, and to bear less responsibility because now I don't have to carry a wallet. I don't have to carry an ID. I just it's just part of me. And that sounds, in some ways, that sounds very appealing, very appealing. Um, but where's that going? Where's that going? So here's a, here's a, there's a term out there. When we, when I was going through school, we used to have what was called the futurist, the futurist. I remember even watching, a, being shown a movie that was showing me, like, it was called like something like Future World or something like that. And they showed this in school to show us the improvement in technology that was taking place and what we could expect, get us thinking about forward thinking of the world. And so I didn't think about this as sort of like a, a brainwashing or a preparation, uh, an indoctrination of sorts that prepared us for our receptivity toward these different types of technology. But I start to wonder, was that part of it? Were they just kind of stocking the pond and getting it ready? I, I don't know. I don't want to go all conspiracy on you. But here's here, this, this stuff is kind of out there, and I think we should have an awareness if our context, if we're going to keep th things in context and keep them, keep the word connected to the word, we've got to have some knowledge of what's going on. Once again, imitation is a ser serious form of flattery. Right now, when we come to church, let me put this in th this context around it. When we come to church, 
we spend a portion of our time together confessing our sins because we know that God who loves us knows us as we are. So we might, we might be able to keep our sins fairly private between ourselves so that my neighbor sitting at the chair next to me or the pew in the pew with me or at the table around me doesn't know anything of what is troublesome to me, what is interfering with my relationship with God. But God knows. God sees. He, he sees what's in my head. He sees what's in my heart. He knows me as I am. He studies me inside and outside. He not only knows the, what my behaviors are like, how I'm be- acting in, in the world, but he also sees the motivations, my feelings, my love or hate of something, and identifies and ju- judges that. We confess that to our God who has shown himself. He's shown us his own heart. He's revealed his own will, his will in his word. And we confess that to to God because we are being honest and open with him that we know we're sinners. We know that there's sin that is separating us and interfering with our relationship. So we confess that. And that's good because he's already he already knows it. We're not high, we're not, even though we think we're hiding it because we can hide it from other people, we can't hide it from him. So we confess that, and he who loves us so much that he sent his son to die for those sins, those sins that we confess, forgives us because of the work that Jesus did for us on the cross. And we share the victory that he had over the punishment for the sins in his resurrection. We get to share in the the new life that he provides for us as he forgives us for the sins that we confess. But he knows that. He knows us so intimately. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Who else wants to know you that intimately? In our our technology, we see people wanting to, I mean, it's dressed up nicely that this will help you, but who else does it help? What else does it do uh, as this information is shared about me? It's interesting in just the past few years about how protective we were. You know, all the rules and you go to the doctor, you got to sign all these documents regarding your privacy. And then how quickly we're, we're willing to give up that privacy because it's, it's marketed as something that's extremely beneficial to us. But are there other objectives that we don't necessarily see that aren't as forthcoming by those who are encouraging us. So here here is the smart pill. That's an an example of something that may be ingested. But here's the direction this is going. This is a website. Uh, My vision is really fuzzy today, so I'm gonna blow that up for us. This is the conversation that's out there. And I I recently asked someone, have you ever heard of this word transhumanism? Transhumanism advances technology, advances in technology could already put evolution into hyperdrive, but should they? So the idea is that in a godless world where we just kind of evolved on our own from, from lower species to higher level thinkers, that now we were going to help in the evolutionary process through intelligent design. You see, this is where imitation, the sincerest form of flattery, they haven't, they, they think they've done away with this and yet they're copying this because now they're going to become the creators and they're going to aid in the evolutionary process by bringing technology together with humanity. And this is, I want you to see this for what it is. This is the, this is the fountain of youth. Okay, this is the fountain. So ultimately, the goal is to to create immortality through technology and the union that would exist between those. So some of the interesting things. This This is a conversation that has been going on for years. Many people are not aware of this, but it's picking up steam, especially as we become more comfortable with the wearables and now with the ingestibles. 
And as the technology becomes more uh, usable, or we see some of the, its benefits, we become more accepting of it. And so there's one web page, and we might think that this is something far away, but here's a TED Talk that uh, I think I'm going to get this for you. Yeah, this is a TED Talk that was in Grand Rapids. The future of work, the future of, uh, I shouldn't say this was a TED Talk. This is the person, Jason Soros, who gave this TED Talk in Grand Rapids. I believe he centered there. And he's talking about all these different things. So I think I want you to think about while while we would might enjoy and appreciate the value of the defibrillator or the pacemaker or the hearing aids or or any of these, even the watch or something, once we start ingesting this information, once this information is shared back and forth, then start start imagining now what well, wouldn't this be think about this. All right, I'm, I'm gonna sell it for a minute, but then I want you to think about it. Wouldn't this be cool if instead of having to reach down and grab a phone or put on a little headset, you were able to just think of the person and in your thoughts communicate with that person. And you wouldn't have to walk through the store looking like some sort of weird person. You would actually be able to consult with someone silently. Technology. Or, or, or maybe you are thinking about something, you don't, you don't have the answer, so you want to Google it. What if you didn't have to reach down for a phone? What if it was on a wearable? Like maybe it starts with just a pair of glasses that you're able to, to use that pulls up a little screen and you're able to read it and get your Google information right through that. But what if they went deeper? And after a point, you stop wearing it and you start becoming that. See, that's the transhumanism. That's the union that's, that's the goal of this. And then eventually, your sentience, your thoughts, your personality is transferred totally into this other environment. And you can live forever because you're no longer bound by a biological limitation of your body. That's transhumanism. That's the that's the direction this is going. This is going there. What what's interesting is I'm gonna take you down here. Just want you to see the sponsors of this particular site, and maybe you can identify with some of those to know that this these are maybe they're not sponsors. They're speeches. These are this is a common audience. This is a common audience. And this person, is, as a futurist, as a transhumanist, is speaking on this particular topic, and this is the goal. So let me give you this picture, just kind of give you this last thought about this, and then I'm going to take you one in, into a dive into God's Word, okay? You see that? We've got a human. We've got the iRobot. Ro oh, that's where a totally artificial intelligence uh, which is portrayed in that movie as something able to think and to feel. And then you have the combination of that. <laughs> this is the scary, as a Trekkie, uh, the scary imagery is that of the Borg. You will be assimilated. Now, the, the idea that we would have free use of information and that that would be made very accessible through wearable devices and maybe even through implantation that could be beneficial. Reading our, our biorhythms and stuff would be beneficial. Uh, but you start to think that th if this is a two-way thing, not only what am I looking for, but how am I influenced by it? What thoughts, what, what other things are being implanted into me? When we're living in a cancel culture, that's where you start to see the great urgency of concern. If people are able to change your mind, not you change your mind, but they change your mind. They cancel your thoughts, certain thoughts. They affect your and influence your personality. They determine what you're able to do and una unable to do. And that's transhumanism. You become part of a hive menta mentality. You are incorporated into the one world order. You, you have a system that 
you're fully incorporated into and you lose your free will. And someone's playing God. And imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Except in this case, they're stealing away from you what God has given you. So we want to look at how this resembles something that we came into contact with in the Word. Uh, In Genesis chapter 3, after Adam and Eve had sinned by eating from the forbidden tree, they were punished, and part of that punishment included them being cast out of the Garden of Eden. This is how that storyline goes. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, plain God, in knowing good and evil. He knew evil formerly was only good. Now you have to understand there's an evil influence that's included in everything in this fallen world. No matter how saintly you may be, you are a fallen person in a fallen world and there is an evil influence at work. Now lest the he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. So you start to build into that transhuman, transhumanist uh, notion, the idea of immortality. And I want to lead you into yet another word that's used among the transhumanists, and that is the posthumanist. The posthumanist is after the transformation has been taken away, you stop identifying yourself as human. Hmm, it's an interesting language, isn't it? Stop identifying as. Hate, hate that phrase, by the way. Um, as human, because you're no longer, you've evolved beyond your humanity. And that's what they're trying to affect. What God created will be altered and changed uh, in this way. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and the flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life. I'm going to step aside here just one more, one more time here. Get untangled. Let me go this way. Hmm. Can that be the hand reaching out, not just uh, as we may be looked at in the beginning of the week, the prospect of the hand reaching to take that forbidden fruit, but how about to take that which has been forbidden yet again, now the tree of life. You know, we have been given access to a tree of life that we have permission to eat from, and that comes from Jesus Christ. God wants us back in relationship with him. He wants us back into paradise he wants to give us this. It's his to give. And yet the world and, and those who are following this transhumanist, godless uh, philosophy and effort, which is having its effect on us, whether we know it or not, it's effective and it's happening around us. That the effort is to take from that tree of life without the permission of God. Just like they took from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil without the permission of God. And the tree of life that God has given us access to is the tree upon which Jesus was crucified. It's the work that he did. It comes through our confession and the forgiveness that he provides us. It's the hope of a resurrection that we get to share with him in the resurrection like his from the dead. As we approach Easter, that's what this is all about in our Christian uh, life is, is being able to enjoy and appreciate the new life that we now have in Christ as he brings us back together, having been separated from, cast out away from him because of our sin, now united again by his grace. And, and not only for this life, but with the promise of an eternal life. And then I want to share with you also this this word. That's not, that was from yesterday. Okay, I, I guess I didn't give us that, that word, but I'm going to give it to you right now. And it turned, this is why I have the Bible right at hand. 
And if you don't have the Bible, I would say, if you don't have a Bible that you're able to carry with you as an intelligent device, smart device, or as one that you're, as a paper, paper work, the technology of, of modern printing, do it by memory. You know, remember God's word. Apply yourself to, to getting that. But here's this word that I want to give you regarding that, that um, tree of life. It comes from Revelation. Yeah. Uh, give me just a second here to find it again. Uh, Revelation chapter 2. This is the, the letter written to the church of Ephesus. And this is what uh, Jesus says. He says, he who has an ear to hear, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, that's uh, the one who conquers, overcomes. Uh, the, the, the conqueror is really the one who believes and trusts in Jesus and follows him, the disciple of Christ. Not, not just believes about Jesus, but follows Jesus, imitates, emulates. If you're going to want imitation in the form of flattery, imitate Christ as a disciple of Christ. And he, to the one who conquers, that's the one who uh, conquers is the one who goes with the conqueror. Jesus uh, has, he makes us more than conquerors. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us, as Romans 8 would say. To, him, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And so he's inviting us, he's welcoming us back by his grace as we put our faith and trust in him. It's not gonna, you're not gonna achieve this by technology. This is, this is a road to nowhere. This is the road to hell. And, it, and it, the road to hell, as it's been said, is lined with good intentions. And so it's, a lot of this may sound very beneficial. You approach with caution, okay, and, and beware. Much of this is done with godlessness. And really, not even godlessness so much as enmity with God. And so beware of that. So has the, the Bible been disproved by science? Has science disproved the Bible? No. Science, and not all of it. There's a lot of good, godly scientists out there. But science, a lot of times, actually imitates God. In this case, with regard to transhumanism, which is at enmity with God, is trying to get something that God only can give by human means, and then this all to become, become something other than human. God, we thank you and praise you for your creation that you have made us human, that you have formed us from the dust, that you've given us life and breath and ability to think and know. And in, the, in science, to, to know you and to know ourselves better as you have created us to be. God, help us to keep you in the equation. Help us to keep our focus on the, the life that you have given us now and the life that you hold and promise for us in, in your paradise. Bring us to that tree of life. Help us not to be dissuaded from this journey and course to follow after a, a lost cause, a hopeless effort to achieve something that you are the only one able to give. God, we pray that you'd strengthen us in our faith and, and give us clear eyes to see the world as it is through the context of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, well, peace with you. Heavy topic this morning. Uh, I don't. I know that I haven't covered it in its entirety, and it's, much of it's really over my head. Uh, but it's it's something I look at still with eyes open. I hope you do too. Keep your eyes fixed on on Christ. And it's Thursday, so I won't be on tomorrow. But Sunday's right around the corner. So go to church. Have a great day in the Lord. We'll see you next week.